My name is Xander Sturgill. And I'm Tyler Griffin, and I, I pulled Xander in today. We are going to do a special episode for General Conference Week, but Xander is our producer for, for everything that we do, so I thought it was important for you to get to see him. And I just wanted to say thanks for watching. We didn't know that when we first started, we'd get so many people watching on Sundays, people watching from out of the country. So thank you again for watching. As we prepare for General Conference, uh, I wanted to take an opportunity to cover some stories from an overview perspective throughout the history of the scriptures, all of the scriptures. Uh, Here's the reason why. Whenever you go to a, an art museum, if they have a really big painting – in this case, I've, I've got a small uh, painting by Jorge Coco – do you ever watch people in a museum look at a painting like this? Do they usually do that? <clears throat> no, that would, that would be kind of weird. Usually people step back they look at the whole painting and they see, they see the, the combination and the blending of the colors and the, the various features of the painting. Then, when you've got that big picture in mind, then it's actually kind of fun occasionally to go up and look closer. So here you have two, two perspectives. You have the big picture and then you have the, the fine detail. We do this with scriptures and with the gospel stories and the gospel events through the history of time. Sometimes we spend the majority of our effort looking so closely at each scripture story in, in an analysis sort of way, we're analyzing, we're looking at the fine details, and then we go to the next story and then the next story and then the next story, so it's kind of like this perspective in the art museum. And it, it's wonderful. I'm not saying that's a bad thing, that's a good thing. What might be helpful occasionally is to step back from those scripture stories up close and personal, that, that analysis phase, and go into more of a synthesis view, to look at the big sweeping picture as a whole and to look for patterns and trends and how the different events and people together. That's what we're going to try to do today as we look at seven dispensations of the gospel of Jesus Christ as defined by Joseph Smith and others where they show these seven dispensation heads and what happened within each dispensation. Now, for many of you, this will be an absolute review. You, you already know all, if not most, of these uh, stories but what we're trying to do is show how they all fit together, how they all tie in together to look for the hand of God to then culminate in seeing that very hand of God through the history of time in the big picture working in our lives, in our world, and in our church today in the seventh or the last dispensation of the gospel. So, to begin, Let's analyze for a second. How does God usually make his, his desires known to people on the earth, his will? How, how, how does he communicate that traditionally based on our scriptural record? Does he usually stand in the, the clouds and shout to everybody at the same time? There have been a couple of occasions where everybody has heard the voice of God speaking at the same time, but that's an exception. The rule looks like this. It's where God in the heavens chooses a, a chosen servant on the earth, parts the veil, reveals himself to that chosen servant, that servant sees things, experiences things, then the veil is closed up again and that servant now goes forth not with faith but with absolute knowledge. When that servant says, I know that God lives, it's different. There's, a, there's an added level of authority and, and experience attached to that testimony. And the promise is that the Holy Ghost will accompany those words that are spoken to those 
who allow a place in their heart for that Holy Ghost to testify of what he is saying. As that prophet, that chosen servant, bears testimony, these people who hear that testimony, they, if they respond to that spirit, they become independent witnesses and they can go and share that testimony with others and say, I know that God lives, and then the human testimony chain can, can keep going outward and the gospel can spread. But it all comes down to – it all comes back to, rather, that person, that chosen servant, having been called of God, having special uh, – a special mission given to them, a divine commission, and it's that dispensation head that starts it all. Now, under this definition, who is our first prophet? As we now step back from all of the scriptures and take a big picture look at all of them, Bible, including the Old and the New Testament, the Book of Mormon, the Doctrine and Covenants, the Pearl of Great Price. Who is our first prophet? That would be Adam. Now, timeline. This is going to be where we, we kind of dump all of this synthesis view. The year is approximately – and again, these years are, are – they're fuzzy. We don't know all of the exact time uh, stamps and all of the calendar systems, so we just – we're okay with using some rough estimates using our own Gregorian calendar today. Roughly 4000 BC, God opens up dispensation number one with the prophet named Adam. Now, Adam is a prophet because of all of his experiences with God, but have you noticed that Adam wasn't alone in the Garden of Eden? He had his wife by his side. The book of Moses in the Pearl of Great Price tells us that God married them in the, in the garden. They're a married couple, and Adam is not alone. Eve is there with all of these experiences. What does that mean? That means that when Adam bears testimony to his future posterity and tells them that he knows God lives, Eve, standing side by side with him, can bear the exact same testimony based on her experiences with God in the Garden of Eden. We put the focus on Adam as the, pro the first prophet, but she is every bit as much a prophetess in that setting. Now, I don't know the reason for this, but it was decided long ago in a different place, and I wasn't part of those meetings, that we would put the focus on history. So you'll notice the scripture pages are filled with the masculine pronouns. I believe that the day will come when we will get to see and hear her story, and it will be told in in fullness someday, and it will be beautiful, and it will be powerful in the shaping of everything that we're going to be talking about from this big picture view of not only the scriptures but of the world. But for some reason that story is being held in reserve for a different time, perhaps even a different place. I don't know. But we know it's there, and it's having a major influence on what's happening here. Now, Adam and Eve come out of the garden, they enter mortality, and they begin having children. According to the book of Moses, they had had multiple children before Cain is born, but their children aren't listening to mom and dad, they're listening, they're hearkening to the adversary, to the devil, and it's breaking their heart. Finally, this son is born named Cain, and uh, Eve says, now I have a son, a man-child from the Lord. He, he's going to be righteous. We know that Cain starts out – he must have started out really good because he has open communication with God. He, he's talking openly and directly with God. Then who knows how many children later – it could have been the next one, it could have been down the road, we don't know – another 
boy is born who, who becomes a target for Cain. How long did Cain hate that brother? The answer is as long as he was able. That's another bad joke. Uh, Cain and Abel become these this type and shadow for two sons of, of God. Both make an offering, a sacrifice. One of them offers a lamb whose blood was shed, who dies. The other doesn't offer anything to die. He just brings some fruit of the fields and offers it. The one offering is accepted and the other is not, and his countenance fell and the devil whispers to him to just kill Abel and then he'll be able to take his flocks. Hmm, sounds kind of like Lucifer, but Abel does get killed by Cain. Down the road, eventually Adam and Eve have another son, Seth, who becomes the birthright son. Adam lives to be 930 years old. And again, are they using the exact same year markers as we are in a Gregorian calendar? Is it a lunar cycle, a, a solar cycle? We don't know for sure all those details. But what we do know is that eventually there's what we call an apostasy, which doesn't necessarily mean that nobody is left on the earth with a belief in God. It just means that the gospel isn't being preached in its fullness with all of its ordinances to the degree that God needs it to happen, so he opens a new dispensation, dispensation number two, in approximately, again, these are very approximate years, 3000 BC, and this prophet is Enoch. Now, Enoch is uh, our second dispensation head. His assignment is quite fascinating because God calls him to be a prophet and his first assignment is go into that wicked city and preach to them. If they don't repent, they're going to be destroyed. That's not a very popular uh, message to share, not, a, not an assignment most of us would want to sign up for. So it's fascinating to watch Enoch interact with God. He gives him three reasons why he shouldn't be the prophet. He says, how is it that I am thy servant, and I am but a lad, and the people hate me? I'm slow of speech. I, I've got this speech impediment. The people hate me, and I'm too young. He was, based on the, the Book of Moses account, uh, it looks like he was roughly 65 years old at this time, or maybe even a little bit older. We don't know for sure, but he's saying, I I'm too young to be a prophet, and because the people hate me, and I'm because I'm slow of speech, I can't be your prophet. Isn't that beautiful? that God comes and calls somebody with such noticeable issues to be his servant. You can't picture God looking at Enoch saying, huh, you're, you're right, I, I wasn't aware of that, let, let me go call somebody more qualified. That's not the God we worship. The God we worship knows all of those limitations and then some, but he calls imperfect people to fill these, these roles and these positions and these responsibilities anyway, and he empowers them to do it. I love one of the things that he says to Enoch in that instance. He says, all your words will I justify. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to give you your words. You don't need to worry about any of this, and I'll justify them. And then at the end of that, uh, that prophetic call, he says, walk with me walk with me. God doesn't just use that with Enoch, a dispensation head. God uses that with me and with you. Walk with me. That's his invitation to all of us. Yes, you have things that make you feel inadequate or that make you think that other people don't like you, or maybe they don't like you, but when you're walking with Jesus, none of that matters because you're relying on his merits and his mercy and his grace, not your own capacities anymore. I love the fact that Enoch accepted that call and he goes into this wicked city and 365 years later we have the perfect society and it's so, so pure, so unified, we call it Zion. They were of one heart, one mind, 
They dwelled in righteousness. There was no poor among them. It was a perfect society. 365 years, one prophet, one city, we finally get it so perfect and and other people come and try to, to plunder and rob and kill people in Zion, so Enoch has to use the power of God to defend the city. He, he moves rivers out of their course. He calls the, the beasts out of the forest. He, he even moves a mountain on one occasion to defend the city, and finally the Lord says, okay, we're going to take you up, and so the city of Zion is translated and taken up by God. 365 years. I need to be very careful here that you, so that I don't miss, uh, misspeak or that you don't misunderstand what I'm trying to say. We're not trying to minimize what Enoch did here. What I'm trying to do is give you a perspective from a big picture view of what's going on then compared to today. In one city, 365 years with one prophet, they became absolutely perfect as a society, as a people, completely unified and one. What is God doing today? He's, he's, his work today is to accomplish this same thing, not just in one city, but in the whole world, a global effort to create Zion and to build up the kingdom of God. Do you realize that the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, established on April 6, 1830, has been on the earth operating just bare, just a little bit over the halfway point of what Enoch had. Is it any, any wonder that uh, the scriptural writers, especially Isaiah and others looking forward to the latter days, said that God would perform a marvelous work and a wonder, something they'd never seen before. It's just marvelous to them and they wonder, how is he able to do it in our day? Because what we're trying to accomplish collectively is what happened in one city, but now we're doing it globally, and it is marvelous and it is wonderful without taking anything away from what Enoch accomplished because that's the standard that we're striving for is what he was able to accomplish. Well, what do you have left on the earth? You have a whole bunch of people who don't know the Lord, ordinances, of salvation in the gospel are not being performed openly and widely, and the, the work is not progressing the way it needs to, so God opens up dispensation number three in approximately the year 2350, 2330, again, approximate dates, he calls a new man to stand at the head of that dispensation, Noah. So Noah has three sons that are mentioned in the scriptures, Shem, Japheth, and Ham, and they all have their wives, and Noah's wife as well. We, we know her name uh, is Joan, Joan of Ark. That was a bad joke. Don't write that down. That, that silly joke. We don't know his wife's name. So Shem, Japheth, and Ham and their wives, this is the eight people that Peter, even in the New Testament, talks about being saved on the ark in the flood. It's in this dispensation where you get the Tower of Babel. It's in this dispensation, the dispensation number three of Noah, where you get the Jaredites leaving the old world and coming to the new with Jared and his brother. So it's a minor dispensation that's begun that we now have in our Book of Mormon as the Book of Ether, but it's once again, they would have looked to Noah as their dispensation head. It doesn't take long in this dispensation before we have an apostasy, especially with things happening around the Tower of Babel. So the need arises to open a new dispensation, call a new prophet to stand at the head of that dispensation. So let's just review here. Number one, Adam and Eve. Adam stands at the head of that dispensation based on our scriptural record. Number two, Enoch. Number three, Noah. Now we go to number four. So God parts the veil, calls a new prophet, dispensation number four, it's approximately 2000 BC, and that prophet's name 
is Abraham. His wife, Sarah, they are promised that they will have posterity bigger than the sands of the seashore and the stars of the heavens, and yet he's a hundred years old, she's ninety, and she's childless. Uh, often, it seems, in the scripture when we're looking at the synthesis of all the stories that have taken place through the history of, of the dispensations, it seems that God pushes people way, way beyond what they think is reasonable or even possible, in this case, possible. How could I, how could I ever have a posterity that's that big when I don't even have one child and I'm a hundred and my wife's ninety? And God sends messengers to deliver the message that uh, your wife will conceive, she will bear a son, and at that point she overhears and she kind of laughs, chuckles, and nine months later a little baby is born and they named him Laughter and Rejoicing, Isaac. So Isaac then becomes this – the beginning of the fulfillment of this prophecy of the posterity of this father and mother of all the faithful for the rest of time. It's this family, this significant relationship right here, they become known as the father and the mother of all the faithful, regardless of who your actual pedigree chart people are in your ancestry, when you enter the fold of God, when you enter into a covenant with God, you become the seed of Abraham and the, the children of Abraham and Sarah. You become a part of their family, even if you weren't before. It's, it's that family that was promised that all nations, kindreds, tongues, and people of the earth would be blessed through this covenant that God made with Abraham. Everybody now has claim on that, not just his, his direct line exclusively. So Isaac marries uh, Rebekah, who happens to be his cousin in the family tree. It's not really a family tree, it's more like a family shrub because they didn't branch out in their marriages back then, Abraham married his niece. Isaac's going to marry his, his cousin, and she's his cousin on a once removed or twice removed on both sides of that family uh, pedigree chart. Isaac and Rebekah have two sons, Esau, who's the oldest, and Jacob. Now, it's through Jacob that the covenant continues on because Esau sold the birthright blessing to Jacob for a mess of pottage, different story that you're probably familiar with in the Old Testament. So Jacob, his name gets changed to Israel. Israel ends up marrying his cousin on both sides of the family structure, uh, Leah, and Leah's sister, her name is Rachel, these two and their handmaids become the mothers of the twelve tribes of Israel. So I'm going to diagram them up here. So you have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve. Here are the twelve tribes of Israel, the twelve sons of Jacob. You have the oldest down to the youngest, Reuben, Simeon, Levi, Judah, Dan, Naphtali, Gad, Asher, Issachar, Zebulon, Joseph, Benjamin. Now watch how this works. Leah was the first to have children, and she has the first four. Rachel's pretty frustrated with this because she's not able to conceive and bear any children, so she says to her husband, here is my handmaid, Bilhah. Take her unto yourself as a concubine, which isn't illegal or inappropriate in their culture. She's not on the level as a wife, but it's, it's all authorized by God, and any children that she has, then I'm going to claim them for my own. So Bilhah gives birth to Dan and Naphtali. Well, Leah hasn't been able to have more children in the interim, so she does the same thing. She says, hey, 
here is my handmaid named Zilpa. Take her and any children she has I'm claiming, so Gad and Asher are born to Zilpa. at which point Leah is able to have two more children, Issachar and Zebulun. And then finally, at the very end, Rachel is able to give birth to Joseph and Benjamin. So you've already got this kind of this internal struggle within the family, and that leads us to the, the great stories towards the end of the book of Genesis regarding Joseph being the birthright son, the oldest son of Rachel. Reuben has lost the birthright because of some things he did, uh, very inappropriate uh, breaking of the law, and so the birthright seems to fall here. None of the brothers seem to like him, the older brothers, he's sold into Egypt, and that sets the stage for this incredible story of, of saving the house of Israel by Joseph and then bringing them down into Egypt. Now, many of you have received patriarchal blessings where your lineage has been uh, declared, and it tells you which tribe you, you belong to, either directly by birth or by adoption. It's tied back into this whole story right here. These are the twelve tribes, the grandson of, Isaac, or of Abraham and Sarah. That's where it comes in. Now, Joseph down in Egypt had gotten married and he had two sons, Manasseh and Ephraim. Manasseh is the, Manasseh is the oldest. So when Jacob comes down into Egypt with the rest of the family to be saved from that famine, and they've relocated now, he says to Joseph, his long-lost birthright son, he says, I'm adopting your two sons, they're going to become mine. That's why Ephraim and Manasseh are considered sons of or tribes of Israel, is because Israel or Jacob is adopting them. So here he is, near the end of his life, he asks Joseph to bring his two sons to him so he can give them their, their blessing, so Joseph places Manasseh at his father, who is, who is going blind, at his father's right knee, and Ephraim at the left knee. Old Jacob crosses his hands to then place them down on their heads this way. Joseph stops him, lifts up his hands, and says, no, father, Manasseh is the, the firstborn. He's the oldest. And Jacob says, I know Manasseh is the firstborn, but I see some things prophetically. He, he, he knows some things. And he says, Ephraim is the one who is going to be responsible for gathering and saving and bringing together all of my family, all of the house of Israel in the latter days. And Manasseh will be his number one assistant. So today, as we speak of the gathering of the house of Israel, the burden, the responsibility, the blessing of that gathering effort falls first on Ephraim's head and right beside him and jointly on Manasseh's head. Those two tribes together, it's their job to go and save all of the house of Israel, just like their father saved all of the house of Israel from the physical famine that was occurring in the land when they brought them into Egypt. So the same thing uh, plays out in our latter-day gathering of the house of Israel with that responsibility being on these two tribes predominantly. The others all help as well, and it's not like these are the good ones and these are second-rate. Everybody has different roles to fill, and part of the joy of living on this earth is discovering your role in the family called the house of Israel and to keep those covenants and to move forward and to fulfill those different roles. Now, you'll notice we always talk about the 12 tribes of Israel. In reality, because we replaced one with two, you really have technically 13, but there are times like when they're going to come into the promised land where <coughs> Levi, doesn't get land. We only divide the land into 12 parts. 
because Levi is the only tribe who holds the priesthood. Nobody else holds the, the priesthood. We call it the Levitical priesthood. 400 years later, Aaron and Moses, two brothers, from that point on we could call it the Aaronic priesthood, the priesthood of Aaron. It's all in the family of Levi. So because he holds the priesthood and nobody else does to that same degree under their law, he doesn't get land because they have to be scattered among all the other tribes to perform the priestly functions of the tabernacle and later on the temple and other uh, rites surrounding the law of Moses. Now, what we end up with down in Egypt is another apostasy and it's going to last for 400 years where they fall into slavery and servitude to the Egyptians. So what do we need to do? We need to open up dispensation number five, approximately the year 1500 BC, and his name, Moses. By the way, Moses was, uh, you realize, Moses is one of the most famous doctors ever mentioned in the Bible, right? Uh, the, the two most famous doctors would have to be Job and Moses. Job, because he had the most patience, but Moses, because he was the one who delivered all of the children of Israel. So there you go, little known fact. Moses is called to take the children of Israel out of Egypt, so he does that after the ten plague experience in Exodus, and uh, by the way, if we pause here in our story and look back for a second, again, this big picture view, look at this. Everything pre-Moses, everything in, in these first uh, four dispensations, so number four was Abraham, everything here is included in one book, the book of Genesis. It's all Genesis is is Moses' abridgment of all of the writings that came before him, from Adam down to Joseph in Egypt. That's the book of Genesis. It's just an abridgment. He's telling you that story, or other, other uh, scribes or copyists or, or people in and around the time of Moses are telling us these stories in editorial format. So now you pick up the story in Exodus with Moses telling his own story. He brings the children of Israel out of Egypt down to the Red Sea. By the way, little trivia, uh, who was the first prophet to go through the MTC? It was actually Moses. Uh, he was one of the only prophets who ever got to go through the MTC, or a sea that was empty. Another bad joke. It's kind of deep, but work on it. So Moses brings these children of Israel out into the wilderness. They wander, they, they get the Ten Commandments, they consistently break the law, they reject Moses' authority, they don't trust that God is able to deliver the, the land of called the Promised Land into their hands. So they end up wandering for 40 years, so there are the Ten Commandments, they wander for 40 years in the wilderness. The book of Numbers gives us a, most of that storyline. Following all that wandering, the leadership is then given to Joshua to take over. So when you're reading in your Old Testament, the story of Joshua is simply the end of that 40-year wandering, and he's the one who takes them into the promised land. Now, our timeline continues. So we keep adding our dispensation heads here across the top, Moses. So under Moses' dispensation, here we are, moving forward again, you had Joshua. Then the ruling of the people is turned over to the judges. People like Samson, people like Deborah, Barak, others in the book of Judges. From there, we turn the ruling over to kings, kings of Israel. Uh, some of the famous kings you're familiar with, 
the, these first three kings, Saul, then King David, yes, this is the same David who slew Goliath, and Solomon. By the way, why do you think Goliath was so shocked, so, so utterly surprised when David hit him with that rock? The reason is because such a thing had never entered his mind before. Shocking, yeah. So, Saul, David, and Solomon. They are kings of unified Israel. Let me draw, let me draw the map so you can see what's going on here, and we'll extend the timeline later. Here's the Sea of Galilee, the Jordan River, the Dead Sea, here's Jerusalem, uh, up here is Nazareth where Jesus, many years down the road from this story, is going to spend most of his boyhood and childhood. When the children of Israel came into the Promised Land, this is what they took over, this land. Saul, David, and Solomon, and the Judges, and Joshua, this is what they had, twelve different lands separated out for those tribes. Remember, Levi was scattered among them because he held the priesthood. Well, Solomon's son is named Rehoboam. Rehoboam is very wicked, <clears throat> and he's very uh, very vain. He, he's focused on himself, and he tells the people, I'm going to tax you more than my father did by far, at which point the northern ten tribes broke off. They said, we're done. We're not going to follow you, and so you get two kingdoms set up as now enemies. They used to be unified. They used to be in the same family. All of the tribes of Israel, they're now enemies. They break up and you get the kingdom of Israel on the north, and you get the kingdom called Judah on the south. This kingdom has two tribes, this kingdom has ten. The two tribes down here are Judah and Benjamin. All the other ten tribes are up north, called the kingdom of Israel. So they put Jeroboam on the throne in the north, and Rehoboam is the king in Judah in the south at the same time. And now the Bible moves forward with a split or divided kingdom of Israel, the one on the north and the one on the south. They have different prophets and different kings. They're at war, usually. They don't like each other. Uh, some of the prophets in the Old Testament, in the second half of the Old Testament that you might be familiar with, that, that might be uh, more recognizable, are Elijah and Elisha. So they're, they're going and preaching to the people up north, along with other prophets in your Old Testament that we would call minor prophets, but they're teaching them, if you don't repent, you're going to be destroyed. They have, they have major issues with, with wicked kings up north. They do in the south as well, but at least they have a couple of, of good ones and righteous kings in the kingdom of Judah as time progresses. So some of the prophets that you might uh, recognize from the kingdom of Judah in the Old Testament are Isaiah, Jeremiah, Ezekiel, Daniel, and I would just add Lehi. He comes out of this same time period, a hundred years after Isaiah, Lehi comes onto the scene. Now, some of you would be thinking to yourself, wait a minute, I thought Lehi, based on the Book of Mormon account, tells us that he's from the tribe of Manasseh. His tribe should have been carried away captive, but they weren't. Here's what happened. 721 BC, Assyria comes to town. So I guess you could say the kingdom of Israel has Assyria's problem, and uh, they wipe out the kingdom of Israel. They kill many people and they carry many of them away captive, and they bring other people in to intermarry with those that they left behind. So it, be it becomes this huge mixture of cultures, of religion, of belief, and, and, and religious practices. That's why the people who were living here at the time of Jesus, called Samaritans, are so um, disliked by the Jewish people at the time of Jesus 
because the Samaritans are half Israelite, half other things, not just in their culture but in their, in their religious practices. And so there's this tension between those two groups of people because of what happened 721 BC. You'll notice that Lehi is in Jerusalem in 600 BC. It's 121 years after this. Uh, apparently, some of Lehi's ancestors, either his parents or grandparents or someone, moved south into the kingdom of Judah. Perhaps they believed the words of the prophets saying, if you don't repent, you're going to be destroyed. Assyria's going to come and wipe you out, and they did. So somebody had relocated down here to put Lehi and his family in a position to have the experiences that we read about in the Book of Mormon. Well, the same thing kind of happens to the people in the kingdom of Judah. In the year 600 BC, you have Babylon who comes to town shortly after that. So 600 BC is where Lehi picks up the story, and he's preaching to the people, if you don't repent, you're going to be destroyed, which is the same thing Jeremiah has been telling them. And Ezekiel is out with the people who are uh, in, in the beginning phases of exile, and Daniel's story is over in Babylon because in 587, 586 BC, Babylon finally succeeds in destroying the city, destroying the temple, killing many people, and carrying the, the rest of them captive into Babylon to the east. Now, our, our big picture synthesis continues, looking at the, the story from a 10,000-foot level here. You're in Babylon, and in the five, 530s, uh, Persia comes to town and destroys the king of the Babylonians and takes over the empire, and he actually sends the Jews back to Jerusalem, he finances the rebuilding of their temple, and you get those stories in the books of Ezra and Nehemiah where we're rebuilding Jerusalem after the exile in Babylon, and then you get some more prophets preaching, and it culminates or it ends in 400 BC with our last prophet in the, the Christian Old Testament called Malachi. He's the last one to write. Now you get a 400-year apostasy, so God has to open up dispensation number six, a new dispensation, and who does he send? His own son. He sends Jesus Christ to be the one to teach people about who God is, what God is like, what he wants for us to do, and how we should act in order to, to build that covenant relationship with him. So Jesus now stands at the head of dispensation number six, which happens to be the most significant as far as what's going to happen and its effect on everybody because of his infinite atonement, but it's also by far the shortest dispensation of all of them that have come before. Because in approximately the year 34, when Jesus is about 33 years of age, he is crucified, leaving Peter in charge. Peter is then killed, probably in the early 60s, maybe 64 AD. Christian tradition says that he was crucified upside down because he didn't want to, to be crucified or die the exact same way as his master. He asked that they put it upside down. That's the tradition. Uh, then that leaves John in charge because James had already been killed previously, Peter, James, then John. They tried killing John, but they couldn't because he had been given some promises that he would tarry until the Lord would come again. Now we enter the longest and most difficult phase of the earth's history called the Great Apostasy. It's going to last for hundreds of years. Uh, 1600, 1700 years, where we don't have people openly preaching a fullness of the gospel of Jesus Christ and performing those ordinances of the gospel, which now sets the stage for us today. 
we have this long growing renaissance where there's this rebirth, this coming to the light, and it's slowly turning on, and people are becoming more enlightened through those through those centuries leading up to <clears throat> the time when the seventh dispensation bursts onto the scene in the year 1820 in a grove that we now call sacred, where God the Father and his Son Jesus Christ come down to this fallen earth for the first time in our recorded canonized scripture. You get the Father and the Son coming together to, to introduce themselves to a person, in this case the young Joseph, and uh, that opens the door for the dispensation of the fullness of times. Now, it's in our day where we pass that prophetic baton on to multiple prophets, Brigham Young being second, then John Taylor, on down until we get to our day where we have President Russell M. Nelson, and we have other members of the First Presidency and the Quorum of Twelve Apostles whom we sustain as prophets, seers, and revelators who are special witnesses, who have messages to share with the world. Now, you'll notice that the growth of the church was on a, uh, a geometric curve pattern until about the, the late 90s and 2000s when it started to level off a little bit with the invention of the internet, things have become more interesting, more difficult where people can say anything they want and be portrayed as an expert or as a quote-unquote prophet themselves. We live in an interesting age where things are happening. God is putting into place elements in the gospel of Jesus Christ through the prophets that we've had throughout time, but for those of us who are alive on the earth today, we can see it in our own lifetimes changes that have been made. It is an ongoing restoration. It is a living church. It's not a stagnant or, or robotic dead church where we have to rely on just the past. God is accelerating his work in different ways today, and it's beautiful. We call this the dispensation of the fullness of times, which means everything that they had back then, all of the privileges, all of the blessings, all of the, the covenants are given to us today in our dispensation. They're given in their fullness and they're still being revealed, which means the gospel is an unfolding restoration. We're going to continue to grow and develop, and God stands at the head of this work. It's not Joseph Smith, it's not Russell M. Nilsson, it's it wasn't Enoch or Adam or Noah or Abraham or Moses, it's the Savior Jesus Christ who stands at the head technically of all these dispensations, just like he does today. Now, we have a unique opportunity with General Conference. It's an opportunity to come together like, Z like Zion, like Enoch's society, come together in unity and in oneness, not in a way to be able to find fault with or, or uh, poke holes in doctrine, but to come together collectively and plead with heaven to pour down his blessings upon the whole earth and upon the heads of the prophets, seers, and revelators, and upon each individual and all of our loved ones, that we can seek truth, know what is real, and know what is a false claim of truth, and be able to triangulate that those truth claims from a big-picture perspective, looking at the history of the gospel, and to be able to see the hand of God, not just in history, not just in the scriptures, 
but in our own life. Now, as you prepare for General Conference or as you reflect on General Conference, depending on whenever you, you watch this particular episode, my invitation is that you turn your heart and your mind heavenward, not to the internet. Ask God what he would have you do with the messages that are shared in General Conference so that my efforts can then help move the work of Christ onward and upward. Uh, we've covered a lot of information. <laughs> I've spilled a lot of ink on the board today, and quite frankly, nothing I've drawn on the board and nothing I've said matters at all if God isn't in his heavens, or if Jesus isn't the Christ, or if God doesn't keep his promises and his covenants. But I'm telling you that what we've reviewed on the board and what we've shared verbally does matter because God is in his heavens. Jesus is the Christ. This is his church named after him and built upon his gospel. It doesn't mean that everything we've ever done has been perfect and flawless, done exactly the way Jesus himself would have done it. It means that he is watching over us collectively and individually, and his works will go forward and until it fills the whole earth and until all of God's children are given that opportunity to accept and take full advantage of those blessings promised to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. In closing, I know God lives, I know Jesus is the Christ, and I know that uh, he is watching over us as we move forward in this, the dispensation of the fullness of times, doing our part to help him in this great gathering of Israel effort. And I leave that with you in the name of Jesus Christ.